Well, good morning, everyone. So nice to see so many folk here this morning. It's wonderful. Um, I will begin with some of our announcements. The first one is a really happy one that I wanted to share. Um, so it's Roger and Diane Angel's 51st wedding anniversary. So we wish to give them a really big... <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I also highlight a couple of things in the announcements. Um, next week, Reverend John will be back, so which is great news. But for this week, if there are any pastoral emergencies, it is Reverend Kathy Brett, and her contact information is actually available in the announcements as well. So I just wanted to let everybody know that, that um, if there are any pastoral emergencies, um, do try to still call into the office with those, but um, she is on call. The other thing that I did want to mention which is the OWLS project, and um, it says here that the Jimmy Pratt Memorial Outreach Center is seeking persons to participate in a survey around a new 55-plus program called OWLS, Older Worker Lifelong Skills Program. And if you are at 55 or plus and would like to participate in this survey, um, they would like you to contact Maureen Hammond. Um, she's the pro program coordinator and her phone number is there, as well as the, um, um, her email address. So please, I really um, encourage people to take part of that survey because I think it would offer some great opportunities for um, those 55 plus folk. Um, so the next thing that I'm gonna do is move into our land acknowledgement. Um, I just wanna first mention that this service I found on the United Church of Canada's website and in their worship resource, and it's part of their creation time in the season of Pentecost. And this particular, there's a, a series of five of them together, and this one is the fourth one, and it's entitled, What is Creation Saying to Us? Love Me. And it was submitted by uh, Reverend Pat Milliken. She's a retired minister from the Ontario area. And it's not a typical service. I will not be officially preaching um, today. And um, it's meant to be far more contemplative and interactive in a way that, um, with some more singing and, um, and that kind of thing. So I hope you enjoy it. I found it, um, as I was going through it, to be quite um, wonderful. And I hope that you will find it the same way. So for to start, I will acknowledge the land on which we live. We respectfully acknowledge the land on which we gather, ancestral homeland of the Beothic and the island of Newfoundland and Labrador, as the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq and Beothic. We also recognize the Inuit and Innu and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. We strive for respectful relationships with all peoples of this province as we search for healing and reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together as one with God. So our call to worship, we will be doing it back and forth, um, and we will have the sung response of holy, holy, holy in the middle of each part, and, um, and Bill will play a little bit, and then we'll sing. So please join me in our call to worship. This morning, the sun's first rays called the day into light. Did you hear the chatter and the song of birds breaking the silence of pre dawn night? Did you see the colors of dawn stretched across the heavens? Did you feel the cool night air shifting to a morning breeze? Creation is stirring. Our day has begun.
some of us woke from peaceful slumber, refreshed and renewed. Yet, we have gathered here, whether reluctant or joyful, weary or rested, we raise our voices in song and praise. Please join me in prayer. Creating one, here we are, a gathering of your people, evidence of creation's unfolding. We come, all shapes and all sizes, all ages and life stages. We come on dancing feet or carefully walking. We come hesitant and unsure or filled with conviction and knowing our way. However we come, we are here to join with all of creation in praise and thanksgiving. Accept our gift of worship with one voice, one hope, one love. We gather in praise. Amen. Please join me in the singing of All Things Bright and Beautiful, hymn number 291 in Voices United. Our first scripture reading this morning 
is an adapted version of Genesis chapter 2, verses 5 to 15. I encourage you to think about the truly astonishing and amazing creation of a human creature and all the items that are placed in the first garden and consider how interconnected and intertwined we are and contemplate God's role in it all. In the beginning, after planets and stars had been sent on their travels, after Earth had been formed and placed in its orbit, but before plants and seeds were created and before the first rain had fallen, God sat down upon the Earth, reached into the dirt, and pulled up a handful of mud. God began to shape and form and mold a human creature. First there was a body and then arms with hands and fingers, legs with feet and toes, and a head for the top, fully equipped with eyes, ears, nose, and a mouth. Eyes to see, ears to hear, a nose to smell, and a mouth to whistle and sing and talk. When the human was finished, God blew gently into its nose. The human took a breath and began to live. The next thing God did was to choose a corner of the earth where a great river flowed, the source of four great rivers, the Pishon and the Gion and the Tigris and the Euphrates. Into this corner of the earth, God placed trees, sturdy, determined oak trees, bending, dancing aspen, sedate maple trees, perpendicular pines, sheltering elms, ash tree for baskets, cedar for fiber, chestnut for food, willow for medicine. Into the garden, God placed fruits, strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, and yes, partridge berries, kiwis and grapes, large glowing watermelons and tiny precious currants, apples, oranges, figs, dates, olives, pears, and of course, succulent peaches. An endless number of fruit to nourish and delight. God planted a garden, and into this garden, God placed the human creature to guard, to cultivate, to tend, and to till, to treasure, and to love to care for the garden, and call it home. We will now enjoy a solo by Christina McNeely, accompanied by Bill Green, Trust in the Lord. Music was composed by Handel.
<clears throat> Thank you so much, Christina. That was lovely. Oh, and I should also mention for those of you, um, Kathy and I are in the same bubble that may not know who we are, so we're able to use the same. So I just wanted to kind of let people know that, especially people online. Um, I'm going to begin with a poem, and I don't know who wrote it because it was part of the service, so I can't give that person credit. It may have been Pat Milliken herself. Um, it's a wonderful poem called Storm Clouds Gathering. <clears throat> In the middle weeks of July, in the midst of a heat wave, when temperatures soared, humidity gathered, and the song of the cicadas sizzled through the endless hot nights, plants and people, animals and insects wilted. The air was without breath or breeze, oppressive, still. In that moment, clouds gathered on the horizon, dark and ominous in the still summer air. A slight current stirred. The darkness of sky stretched over the land. Winds grew in ferocity. Trees bent to the earth. Branches writhed and twisted. The air became a cacophony of rushing sound as the rain hit, pounding against the earth, driving against the fields, drowning the world in the white noise. Life twisted, branches torn, trees shattered. Abruptly, wind faded, rain eased, clouds scattered into silence. In a storm-bruised world, the litter of broken leaves, the debris of branches scattered, the chaos of trees uprooted, devastated lives, devastated hearts. Stripped of sound and fury, the air was clear and cool, still and silent. Into the silence came the booming drumbeat of our neighborhood bullfrog, speaking reassurance from the roadside ditch. Gently came the first call of killdeer and the muted sigh of mourning doves. Our next scripture reading comes from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 8 to 12. And it is a small part of the story of the prophet Elijah, and it is of a time when Elijah is running for his life, seeking a place of safety. And readings begin where he journeys to Horeb in Sinai, and the holy mountain, and hides in a cave. So Elijah got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper.
It's easy to sing about all the bright and beautiful things in creation, but for those who are born witness to the impact of a windstorm or hurricane, like the poet who penned Storm Clouds Gathering, may understandably find, like Elijah just did, that the voice of God comes out of silence, not out of the storm. That said, to truly love creation requires us to listen to all of creation, the powerful storms in their stark beauty that reshape a landscape and may even destroy life as well. And then we're also asked to appreciate the gentle beauty of the bird song or the preposterous thump of a bullfrog call. The challenge of loving creation may be a reminder that the coyote and the wolf are just as worthy of a space on this earth as Bambi, the gentle deer, and the close meadow animal friends. We are called today to explore this challenge of loving the totality of creation by naming our lament and sorrow for the elements of creation which cause us dismay, concern, the frighten, and that challenge us. What is easy to love? What is difficult to love? And how do you love anyway? What shape will our love for all creation take? Will it be in concrete, tangible ways or in the small choices that we make daily? In the naming and answering of these types of questions, we may come closer to a sense of acceptance and the beginning of an understanding. And then we can move beyond the sorrow and the lament into praise, thanksgiving, and deeper love. I hope in the singing of our next hymn, number 374, you will be able to come and find the quiet center. Hymn number 374. So finally, it's interesting that Pat Milliken decides to use the well-known scripture reading from Job 38 to be the last scripture reading that we hear today. And even if you haven't read the whole book of Job, most people are aware that it is about a man, Job, a very faithful and pious man 
who loses everything important to him and endures great suffering. And leading up to this chapter, Job has been talking, Job has been talking with his friends and questioning God on why he's been enduring such suffering and more specifically, innocent suffering. And chapter 38 is the first time that Yahweh, that God, finally responds to Job. And as I read the following, as actually Kathy reads the following scripture passage, I want you to listen to God's words to Job. You will probably notice that God does not directly answer Job's questions about suffering. Um, maybe um, it's not the response that you think you're going to get, nor probably was it for Job at the time. And it seems like an awful lot of questions back at us. So when we hear that kind of thing, we know we are asked to look deeper and to be open to hear what God is saying. And God's response is teaching us that there is something more fundamental than an intelligent human response to innocent suffering. I think what God is trying to tell us is that God displays the limitations of man and man's understanding in comparison to God's power and wisdom in creating and sustaining the universe. God's emphasis is on creation, and God's actions in creation is the response and the answer. We, like Job, need to discern what is being told to us, and I would hope that after we hear this passage and hear these questions, that you and I, like Job, will come to trust and have a more complete confidence in God, a creating, sustaining, redeeming, just, and loving God. Job chapter 38, the Lord speaks. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm, and he said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me, if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Who shut in the sea? Shouted for joy. Sorry, who shut in the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? when I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it and set it doors and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come and no farther, here is where your proud waves halt. Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place, that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it? The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their light, and their upraised arm is broken. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the deepest darkness? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know this. What is the way to the abode of light? And where does the darkness reside? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths to their dwellings? Surely you know, for you must, you were already born. You have lived so many lives, so many years. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or seen the storehouses of the hail, which I reserve for times of trouble? for days of war and battle? What is the way to the place where the lightning is dispersed or the place where the east winds are scattered over the earth? Who cuts a channel for the torrents of rain and a path for the thunderstorm? To water a land where no, lives, no one lives in an uninhabited desert, 
to satisfy a desolate wasteland and make it sprout with grass? Does the rain have a father? Who fathers the drops of dew? From whose womb comes the ice? Who gives birth to the frost from the heavens when the waters become hard as stone, when the surface of the deep is frozen? Can you bind the change, chains of all Pleiades? Can you loosen Orion's belt? Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons or lead out a bear with its cub? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Can you raise your voice to the clouds? Can you cover yourself with a flood of water? Do you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do they report to you? Here we are. Who gives the ibis wisdom or gives the rooster understanding? Who has the wisdom to count the clouds? Who can tip over the water jars of heavens when the dust becomes hard and the clods of earth stick together? Do you hunt the prey for the lioness and satisfy the hunger of the lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in a wait in a thicket? Who provides food for the raven when its young cries out to God and wander about for lack of food? Let us reply to God with a proclama proclamation of how wondrous God's world truly is by singing hymn number 296 in Voices United. This is God's wondrous world. So our next thing that we're going to do as a congregational response um, is a selection from the Song of Faith from 2006. And if you aren't uh, familiar with the Song of Faith, it's the United Church of Canada. Um, it's a verbal picture of what the United Church of Canada understands its faith to be in the historical, social, political, and theological context of the early 21st century. Um, it's part of the United Church tradition for us to um, look at our faith over the years. We've had the doctrine, uh, the doctrines of faith. We've also done uh, the new creed. And in that tradition, the song of faith is part of that. And we will be saying a small portion of it. And just to let you know, the song of faith, it's an, 
It's a means of ongoing reflection and an invitation for the church to live out its convictions in relation to the world in which we live. And this section happens to be about the creation portion, but I do really recommend you to read the Song of Faith. It's, um, it's quite extensive, and it's, um, it's kind of poetic, kind of prose. Um, it's very interesting, and I think it's a good read for anyone. But please join me. We we're going to say this in unison, and um, it starts. We witness to holy mystery that is holy love. God is creative and self-giving, generously moving in all the near and distant corners of the universe. Nothing exists that doesn't find its source in God. Our first response to God's providence is gratitude. We sing thanksgiving. Finding ourselves in a world of beauty and mystery, of living things diverse and interdependent, of complex patterns of growth and evolution, of subatomic particles and cosmic swirls. We sing of God the Creator, the maker and source of all that is. Each part of creation reveals unique aspects of God the Creator, who is both in creation and beyond it. All parts of creation, animate and inanimate, are related. All creation is good. We sing of the Creator, who made humans to live and move and have their being in God, in and with God. We can direct our lives toward right relationship with each other and with God. We can discover our place as one strand in the web of life. We can grow in wisdom and compassion. We can recognize all people as kin. We can accept our mortality and finitude, not as a curse, but as a challenge to make our lives and choices matter. Please join me as we sing, Lord, listen to your children praying. We'll sing two verses of it, and um, it's found in Voices United, number 400. Lord, listen to your children praying. Such a simple song, but so powerful. <laughs> Please. Let us pray. Holy One, breath of creation stir in us. Open our hearts that we may see all of creation's glory. Open our hearts that we may know life is holy. Open our hearts that we may love with wonder and awe and reverence. Creating one, we understand that we live within creation, all woven together by the sacred breath of life. We confess that times we have chosen to forget. We name to you our careless greed when, we habitat, when habitat has been denied, when invasive species have been introduced, when thoughtless destruction has been allowed. Of 
bullfrogs, the discreet beauty of the painted turtle, the majesty of the blue, ice blue glaciers, the healing wonders found in the thick, dense rainforests, all of your creation that is being diminished and threatened by our disinterest or by our complacent greed. Forgive us. Help us to discover the second chance of a growing awareness, a deepened understanding, and active love. May we live wisely with reverence for creation. May we live gently on this earth, giving room, sharing space, providing for all. We celebrate the steps taken to redeem this earth, the tall grass pr prairie replanted, the wild turkeys returned, groves of trees reestablished, plastics pulled from the ocean, voices shouting for our planet's best interest. Bless us as we better love your creation. To you we give our praise and thanksgiving for all that delights, for all that teaches, for all that is wondrous, for all of creation. Thank you. Sustaining, redeeming God, we offer our prayers for humanity, for broken hearts and wounded spirits, for moments requiring strength and courage, for our daily needs. We bring them to you now in a moment of silence. We gather all our prayers into one by praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom. Power and glory, forever and ever. Amen. We are gifted by a world that delights and astonishes us, frightens and informs us, provides all that we need and more than we should possibly want. From this abundance we have received, and in turn we give our gifts of thanksgiving. Our morning offering will be received. Creating God, with these gifts we say thank you for all of creation, from the ugly earwigs to elegant birth butterflies, from startling storms to star-filled nights. We are grateful to be part of all that is. Holy One, whose breath is our life and whose grace is our hope, receive the gifts we offer. Bless them and that they may be faith lived out, hope lived, and love given to for this world. Amen. And our final hymn is hymn number 232, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore You.
Thanks so much, Bill. Our benediction. As people of God, you form a community of faith within the United Church of Canada. Within this community of faith, we are blessed and blessing. Go now with loving hearts and hands willing to serve. We go into this world singing with creation, cherishing all living things, and loving all facets of our earth ever more deeply. Amen.